All right, I'm giving the sign here that we're going to go ahead and get started. So if you want to go ahead and grab a seat, fasten your seat belts, that's important, part of traffic safety. And I am Glenn Blackwelder. I'm with the Utah Department of Transportation. I am the operations engineer for traffic and safety. And I was asked to prepare a little bit on uh, innovative intersections and how you drive them. I understand that there are some questions about how to drive some of the, the newer intersection forms that we're installing in Utah. Um, we also have a bonus round. We're going to talk a little bit about rail crossings with my colleague Jim Golden and some, some recent things that we've done with rail crossings as well. So with any, without any further ado, let's uh, get started. Um, I'll notice, note the subtitle there is DDIs, CFIs, and roundabouts. And I'm just going to ask for a show of hands. Who here has heard of a DDI? I'm seeing a smattering of hands. How about a CFI? Similar number. And roundabouts? Pretty much everyone. So let's get started here. So why are we doing these innovative intersections? Well, it's really just because of one thing, left turns. Left turns have a variety of issues that are associated with them. And we're going to take a tour of left turn issues as part of how we are looking at innovative intersections. There's three major issues that we wind up with left turns. Queue storage, delay, and safety. And each of these innovative intersections kind of addresses one of those. So uh, queue storage is the diverging diamond. That's, that's one of the things it does best. Delay, uh, the CFI is a, a big one for delay and capacity. And finally, safety, we'll talk about roundabouts. So moving along here, this is a traditional diamond interchange, what we call a tight diamond. The interchange, uh, what we have right here, let me get my pointer. What we have here is two signalized intersections and a freeway in between them, and a, uh, a bridge over the top. Now, the problem that you have is if you want someone to come here and turn left onto the freeway, and you've got that in both directions, the problem is what are you going to do with the people that are waiting to turn left at the light? In this case, we've got two left turn lanes here and a left turn lane there, and you notice that they're all located uh, side by side. That's because space in this bridge is at a premium. You'll notice we even have a lot of wasted space over here. Normally what we would like to do with left turns is put them back to back, but there's no room. You can't store cars here. So we wind up building the bridge wider, and wider means more expensive, as in millions of dollars more expensive. So what's the solution to that? Well, I'm going to play a little video here uh, that shows uh, what our solution is. The new diverging diamond interchange at 1100 South and I-15 in Grimmie City functions much like the one in American Fork Main Street shown here. A DDI works differently than other interchanges, with cross points at each end of the bridge. This may seem a little disconcerting at first, but these cross points are actually the reason DDIs function so smoothly. They allow for more open traffic flow between the freeway and the interchange. Since driving a DDI will be a little different from what most of us are used to, let's take a closer look at how a DDI works. Let's say you're traveling eastbound and want to get on I-15 heading south. As you drive toward the interchange, you'll get in the farthest right-hand lane and simply merge on the I-15 southbound. Easy enough. But what if you want to head north on I-15? In that case, you'll move into the leftmost lane as you approach the intersection. As you cross through the intersection, you'll notice cars on your right stop at the traffic light and a lane on your left, vehicles exiting the freeway. You continue across the bridge and move into the left turn lane, which will merge directly onto I-15 northbound. Not too complicated, especially since there will be signs and street markings that will make this whole process easy and intuitive when you're driving it. Now let's say you want to cross the freeway from east to west. You can use any of the regular traffic lanes, simply follow the pavement markings, and continue through the next crossing intersection where you'll switch back to the right side of the roadway. 
exiting the freeway through a DDI will be a little different as well. Let's say you're driving northbound on I-15 and want to head east. You exit the freeway and stay to the right when the off-ramp divides, then simply turn right and merge with eastbound traffic. If you want to exit northbound I-15 to head west, stay on the left side when the off-ramp divides. The DDI configuration allows you to merge directly into westbound traffic lanes without having to cross eastbound traffic. Continue across the bridge, following directional signs and markings, until you come to the crossing intersection, where the westbound lanes will switch back to the right side of the roadway, and continue west. All of these movements will be clearly signed and marked, so you'll know exactly what to do. So this video is available on, on YouTube if you need this. But I wanted to hit a couple key points on driving a DDI. The thing, first number one point is don't turn at the signals. The signals are designed to go straight through, uh, follow the uh, striping and the signs to your destination. My slides don't wanna advance here. Um, while we're here, uh, are there any, any questions regarding driving DDIs? Have, have you seen any in your experiences? Yes. Exactly. That's a good point. It is the one place where we do have on the exit, uh, you will see signs that say left turn on red allowed because it is a left turn into that one way movement. Good point. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So uh, one of the questions that I wanted to address in this was, what happens if we actually have someone driving the DDI wrong? There's a couple of things that we, I want to point out. Wrong way in the crossover, what we've seen people do is go through until you get to the other signal and get back on the arterial in the correct direction. It doesn't happen very often, but when it does, um, we haven't actually seen a lot of, lot of issues with it. Um, and I think the other one that we want to communicate on what happens when you're in one of these innovative intersections and you miss your turn, well, once you've missed your turn, just continue on through, find a safe place to turn around, come back and take another shot at it. So one of the things that we've been doing recently is we've put up some thermal imaging cameras that have allowed us to capture wrong way maneuvers at various locations. And one of these is the diverging diamond. This is the one in St. George. So we'll see what a typical DDI wrong way looks like. So if you're looking here, the, uh, the diverging diamond, this is the correct direction and traffic should come towards you here in the crossover. So this person's gone the wrong way. They're picked up on our detection. They're traveling through. Notice there's another vehicle coming. They're moving fairly slowly, so they, they pass each other. Goes down to the end. This, see this car here? And that car will rejoin the correct direction right about there. So we, we see this about once or twice a month in, in St. George, and we have not seen any crashes related to that. So one of the questions I wanted to answer was, what happens if someone goes wrong way in the, in the diverging diamond? Well, that's what happens. The thing to avoid would be going wrong way and then entering the freeway, which would put you wrong way on the freeway. But that's one of the things that we've seen. Um, here's a what not to do. This is a case where we have, this is a different diverging diamond. Once again, this now let's see, this car right here is actually in the wrong way side of traffic. And yep, see, there's another person. He's saying, well, why am I wrong way? Okay, what can I do to fix this? So he's going to pull around, go around the corner here. And now he's wrong way again. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We've, we've seen a few uh, wrong ways at this location as well, and, and we have not seen any crashes, but it's one of those ones where I, we, we ran across this one recently, and one of my coworkers forwarded to me and said, you got to check this out. So, as, so there's some contextual clues for avoiding wrong way driving. 
of course, striping. If you see the yellow stripe on your right hand side, you may have a problem. You keep the yellow on the left, the right on the white. And while I was uh, working up this presentation, I actually thought of something else here. If you see the stop bar right here, if you're entering an intersection, you should go across the stop bar. But if you're exiting an intersection, you don't want to be driving across the stop bar. You want to be driving where there isn't a stop bar. So just some contextual clues. Yes. In Louisiana, they have reflectors in the road that are red when you're going backwards. Mm -hmm. They do that with the snow plows. If you install something on the side, it would reflect red. Because you're showing this at, at night usually when mm -hmm. there's not a lot of traffic flow. That's when maybe the most of the mistakes happen. Yeah. Those sort of things. All right, so I'm going to repeat your question, which is, um, have we looked at red reflectors in the pavement or elsewhere to uh, to indicate that you're going the wrong direction? And the answer is actually yes. Uh, we're doing that. We're looking at the possibility of possibly recessing the reflectors so that we can plow over the top of them. Uh, we're looking at a product that actually appears white, a pavement project, a pavement striping project that appears white in one direction and red in the other direction. Uh, we may be trying that out within the next few months here. There's also uh, our standard practice for off ramps is that we put um, red uh, backings to each delineator post. So there, we're, we're looking at various things related to that. So good, good, good question. So moving along. So the next left turning issue that we deal with is lack of capacity. Um, this is an intersection. Whoops. Sorry, guys. Student driver here on the clicker. Once you get your intersection built out with we'll do lefts all the way around, uh, the, the intersection is pretty much at capacity. We've added, we've done some uh, locations. I'm wondering how many of you have ever driven through a left turn that had three left turn lanes? It's not very common, and part of the reason is uh, we find out in traffic engineering, when we add that third left turn lane, it only carries about a half as much traffic as your first two left turn lanes. The reason is when you're making that left turn, most people have some place they want to go. Say the major, one of the major things is on the left side a block down. Now everybody wants to be in that one left lane and you don't get any use out of the additional left turn lanes that you've had. It's called lane utilization and we have a, in general, the third left lane doesn't help much. So. How are we going to deal with a lack of capacity? The solution is a continuous flow intersection. So here we go. At Utah, a major goal is to optimize mobility. And in Utah, the continuous flow intersection is a continuous flow intersection. And in Utah, the continuous flow intersection is a continuous flow intersection. And in Utah, the continuous flow intersection is a continuous flow intersection. And in Utah, the continuous flow intersection is a continuous flow intersection. And in Utah, the continuous flow intersection is a continuous flow intersection. And in Utah, the continuous flow intersection is a the traffic signal also means you can't keep moving, and the more traffic there is, the more complicated the signal. A CFI reduces conflict points, which leads to more green time at the intersection. The most visible feature of a continuous flow intersection is the left turn crossover. This allows drivers to make their left turn before they reach the intersection, reducing conflict points. This feature alone is recruited to increase the number of cars moving through the intersection by up to 70%. But for a CFI to work at its maximum potential, drivers should be aware of all its features. In a continuous flow intersection, the fewer crossing lines of traffic, the better. So a CFI can include a bypass right turn, which allows right turn cars to avoid cross traffic altogether. Sometimes a bypass right is omitted in order to keep local businesses operating. Avoiding business disruption to force the economy. In such cases, right turning cars must wait at a special route before proceeding. This route prevents conflict with the left turn crossover vehicle. Sometimes, crossover left and right turning drivers will converge at the same time. It's important that each car stay in its own lane as each vehicle comes together. Sometimes, drivers get distracted and drift out of their lane when turning, but this doesn't work in a CFI where each driver needs their own lane to turn safely at the same time. If the road isn't wide enough to receive all incoming traffic, right turns may need to wait for crossover left while other drivers continue moving. Once the crossover left are finished, right turns are free to keep your 
further. Continuing the flow, which is actually increasing the routing while increasing the green highway intersection. Just one more example of how you got keep you moving. One thing to note from that video is that both the diverging diamond and the continuous flow intersection do actually show us an increase in safety because they have removed the left turns from the from the major part of the roadway because they've reduced that left turn conflict. So some keys to driving a CFI. If we're looking here, um, this is uh, basically a left turn coming off of a side street with a traditional left turn moving towards an approach that has a CFI. Uh, what will happen with left turners is that they have to hit this middle area here. You'll notice we've got lanes here and they have a stop bar. And that stop bar indicates that we've got traffic coming in the opposing direction. We also have a keep right sign or a keep, sorry, keep right here and a keep left there. And the key thing to remember is hit that center. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, this one, actually, we'll talk about that on the next slide. The question was about a right turn here and whether you needed to wait for the light. This is actually a CFI with a right turn bypass. So this right turn bypass comes up and goes around and actually enters after the left turn pocket. This one, you won't even see a light for this. It's a free right. Yeah, so this is a free right and you'll be able to go straight through. That's, that's, that's one. So this is the one with the bypass. The next one that we're looking at here, if I can get this thing to advance. Um, fighting the slides here today. The arrow key on it's not working. That's disconcerting. All right. So here is one. This is a, a, a CFI without the right turn bypass. And on this one, it's very critical actually to follow the no right turn on red sign. So notice we've got the right turn on red sign here. On the far side over here, we've got a blank out sign and it'll have a no right turn when it's uh, not safe to, to proceed. So the key reason here is we've got the left turn pocket right here. If you make a right turn here while the through traffic is going, that left turn will also be going. So if you do a traditional right turn on red, you'll pull up, look left, pull out, and you can get hit by the left turn, left turning vehicles. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so it's one of these things where watch what the what the what the intersection is telling you. Uh, this one has this one does not have the right turn bypass. If it had a right turn bypass, the right turn would actually go on the near side of that left turn pocket down and past the end of the left turn pocket. Are there any other questions on driving a CFI? All right. We'll move along here to a couple of questions about what happens if you do it wrong. If you ignore the right turn on re restriction, that's not good. That puts you basically at a, at a right angle in, uh, crash with those left turns. So the right turn on red restriction is very important for safety in the CFI. Uh, if you turn wrong way in the left turn pocket, there's usually actually no conflict. And once again, if you miss your turn, don't try and correct, follow through and backtrack. So here's a very typical wrong way that we occasionally see at CFIs. This once again happens a couple times a month. So this is one where we've got the, the by, right turn bypass and notice this person didn't use the right turn bypass and said they came and they're going wrong way in the left turn lanes coming through here. Up, out, and what happens is there was no one in the left turn lanes, they just processed through and now they're going the correct way. And there's someone doing the, the correct in the right turn lane. So let's look at another location on this um, 
What about a left turn instead of right turn? Last time we had someone come up and make an incorrect right turn here. Let's say someone's coming this way and they're making a left turn in the intersection and they miss their appropriate through location here and turn. Well, they wind up in the left turn pocket. Once again, we're getting detected with them going wrong way left, but they, that's two for one. Same intersection, but typically what we're seeing with these wrong ways, if you wind up wrong way in the left turn pocket, once again, speeds are slow and the way the signal's timed, there's not, there's typically not a conflict with that. In fact, I've even seen UDOT snow plows come down when they're coming through on this intersection. Through here, they'll have a plow string and one of them will pull out and actually will plow the left turn pocket going wrong way because it, it's, uh, when they've actually got that green light coming through, they're going to get the green light at this location. If there's no one in the turn pocket, they can proceed through on and clear it. So it's not something that's desirable, but it doesn't tend to cause a ton of issues if you wind up wrong way in the left turn pocket. Have you ever heard the saying, though, that nothing is foolproof provided you have a sufficiently talented fool? Here's someone who actually did get in the correct right turn bypass lane, but had a little problem with it. This car coming around to the right turn here. <laughs> yeah. We, we kind of think there might have been a touch of impairment there for that one. So let's let's catch that one one more time. So here they are coming through. This is actually the correct location. This is the right turn bypass. Whoop, up and over. Now they're wrong way. Fortunately, we don't have any opposing traffic. This is this is late at night, and they're now the correct direction. I I hope they made it safely wherever they were going. So, and what if you want to avoid this situation? If safety, is the problem, roundabouts really are the answer. So compared to a traffic signal, a roundabout has 35% less total crashes and 74% less injury crashes, and fatalities are almost entirely eliminated. Um, I've, I've seen different versions of these numbers over the years. They change depending on who does the study, but they're almost always in this 30 to 35% less total crashes and 75 to 80% less injury crashes. And once again, fatals are almost totally eliminated. Um, a number of years back, I went to a roundabouts conference and someone had done taken 10 years of roundabout crash data in a European country, I think it was, I think it was Germany, and they had looked at all the crashes and for hundreds of locations across Germany, and they found a total of three fatalities. Um, I think one was a pedestrian, one was a bicyclist, and one was a suspected suicide. So really, uh, at a roundabout, the only fatalities that we really typically see are, in fact, vulnerable users. Uh, pedestrians and bicyclists, and roundabouts are in general uh, safer for uh, pedestrians and bicyclists as well. And why is that? Well, it's a, it's a couple of things. Roundabouts are designed to be low speed. Uh, typically, as, as a roundabout designer, I'm trying to get speeds down in the 20 mile an hour, 15 mile an hour range as, as someone comes through the roundabout. The curves in a roundabout are designed specifically to produce a reduction in speed so that um, the curve on the entry here slows you down to the speed where you need to go around the circulating road, which is oftentimes around 10 miles an hour, and then exit back out in a smooth curve that is also designed to, to keep speed down. The other thing that a roundabout does is it eliminates conflict points. If we're looking here, these uh, clear, these round circles here are crossing conflict points. If you draw all the paths through an intersection, you wind up with 16 locations where people cross. If you look at a roundabout, 
it's zero. So we've eliminated the right angle collisions. Uh, intersect, um, collisions in a roundabout tend to be sideswipe rather than angle, sideswipe or rear end. So what about driving around abouts? The first rule of driving around abouts is always go to the right of the center island. If you're gonna make a left turn, don't shortcut across through here, always go around. And this is true whether you're looking at a full-size roundabout or a mini roundabout, but the, the idea is that the left turn goes out and around the, around the island. And the second rule of roundabouts, and this is really the only, two, the only rules we have, are yielding. So yield at three points. First point you yield is at the pedestrian in the crosswalk. If there's no pedestrian drive on through. And then there's a yield at the circulating roadway. The person in the circulating roadway always has the right of way. How many of you have seen um, the scene from uh, National Lampoon's European Vacation where they get stuck in the traffic circle at the Champs Elysees? That is actually not a modern roundabout. That's a big traffic circle. One of the features of a modern roundabout is that the person in the interior of the roundabout has the right of way. You can always get out. The second thing about this is you notice the yield here. Once you yield and enter, the last yield that you have is if you have a pedestrian crossing on the exit. And you'll notice that the crosswalks are set back from the circulating roadway. Uh, on a single lane roundabout, that's 25 feet or basically enough to store one car. The idea is you deal with the crosswalk yield and then you get in front of that and there's a space to wait and yield on the circulating roadway. Same thing when you're exiting, you get out of the circulating roadway before you have to deal with the crosswalk again. So that's a kind of a feature of how the roundabout is set up so that you can drive it safely. Any questions on driving roundabouts? Yes. So the question is, how, how, what about two lane roundabouts? And the answer is those do get a little trickier and it's important to do good design. So I think the main thing on, on the two lane is to watch for the lane use signs. You should have lane use signs like this and lane use arrows. And that'll tell you how you wanna get through. And the critical part is choosing the proper lane. And once you're inside the, the multi-lane roundabout, if you're traveling here, the straight arrow says that, yeah, you're gonna go straight off and the through and left indicates that you can either go through and off or continue around the roundabout. So here's a complex example. And I'm gonna walk through a couple of movements here on how you're supposed to interpret this. So coming up here, let's say that you wanna make a left turn going northbound. You come up here and let's choose the, the inside lane here come through and the you know it's the dash line here you, you cross the dotted line and come through into this one you, you want to continue making the left turns so you're coming around notice here that it actually pushes you into the outside lane with what we call spiral striping comes around and then there is an exit here to come off uh, if you were in this lane making the same maneuver you would come through once again through around and off so Typically, what you want to do is really follow the striping on a two-lane roundabout. So we have times in Utah, though, where we have, we say we have the greatest what on earth? The greatest snow on earth, yes. And what happens when we get snow on top of the striping? The answer is that double-lane roundabouts struggle a little. And the typical way that I would handle that is just drive them as a single-lane roundabout. It tends to happen anyway. We get snow piled up around the edges and it, you, you just deal with it single file as a single lane roundabout rather than going side by side. Hopefully during the snow, we also have reduced traffic volumes so that, that the roundabout will function well at that 
lower volume as a single lane roundabout. Any other questions on, on two lane roundabouts? All right, not hearing any, we'll move on. So what happens if you do it wrong? Well, roundabouts are a low speed environment. In general, that's gonna make it easier to avoid other vehicles. And if worse comes to worse, your car will probably need some work, but you won't. That's the, the beauty of the low speed and the roundabout. Really, the reduction in conflict points does tend to really reduce the number of crashes, roughly 30%. But the big thing is it really reduces the high impact crashes, the injury crashes, the fatalities. If you go wrong in a roundabout, um, your local body shop will thank you. So with that, um, I'm going to turn over the rest of the time to Jim Golden to talk a little bit about railroad crossings. So Glenn is really the expert here, I think. I'll try to put this on real fast. And so um, we'll hang around a little bit after if there's, some, if there's more questions about these, but I brought him in to talk about these complex. Uh, I know you guys are teaching young drivers uh, how to drive these, you know, kind of complex. Actually, Glenn and I, as we were talking, as we were driving down this morning, he said, sometimes we have more problems with uh, or older drivers getting used to these because they're used to other things more than educating new drivers on how to do that. But uh, fairly simple, follow the, follow the striping, follow the signs and you'll be okay. And uh, like I said, Glenn, he, when I'm done, if we have other questions, you can, you can ask Glenn. I wanted to take just a quick moment and, uh, and highlight uh, any of you that have been in, in my class, I know a couple of you have been, or with Walt Webster or any others, you're familiar with this sign, correct? You guys know what an emergency notification system sign is, okay? We just had, um, UTA asked me to highlight this to all instructors, if we could. Uh, in Provo the other day, had a car come through an inter intersection. Car comes through, and as it's making a turn, the right tire, we're not sure what happened, but the angle, the, the axle just breaks. And it just turns over the tires just there and it's laying there on the road cars disabled right in the middle of uh, the front runner tracks okay so you guys all know what to do right what would you do first thing you'd find the number you'd call it that would connect you to uta dispatch uta dispatch would say what's your location you would say i'm at crossing number whatever the number is and they would say okay we know what's coming your way we'll get those trains stopped okay well we put a timer on this one the guy gets out of his car. We're watching this on video. The guy gets out of his car. Uh, he looks at the tire. He's trying to figure out, he kind of scratches his head. He doesn't know what to do. A couple of pedestrians come by there, look at him. How are we gonna help you? He goes back, starts to get it into his trunk like he's gonna get and fix the tire or something like that. Um, about three minutes in, about three minutes in, here's a, a, a cop pulls up, you know, local police. He pulls up, he goes out and kind of scratches his head, looks out like, I don't know what to tell you here, what we're gonna do. Well, maybe we better go call somebody um, as they're going to do that, about seven and a half minutes in, the bells start, the bells activate. And front runner comes around the corner. Front runner sees them, goes into emergency braking. Okay, and you guys all know the story, how long it takes a train to stop. Front runner came around, even though it can stop fairly quickly, it got to the truck, or got to that car, and maybe pushed it about 15 or 20 feet before it finally came to a stop. Eight minutes in. And all UTA said was, all they had to do was call us, and let us know we could have stopped front runner, we could have been there in time. So as you're out, I, I try to emphasize this a lot with the driver's ed students I talk to, if you could do this as you cross rail crossings, as you look and see these signs should be at every single rail crossing in the state. And if you can just point that out to the kids and even tell them to go back home and tell their parents about it. Say, hey, mom and dad, guess what I learned in uh, driver's ed class today? I learned about these signs. These have been, I think, and Walt could correct me on this if he's around, I think it's about 11 or 12 years ago these became standard all across the country. So this is all across the country. This will be there. Quick reminder on that. Now, <clears throat> I'll geek out for just a minute with you. Um, we have started to install uh, a new type of signal in, uh, in the state. There's a couple up in North Salt Lake. There's eight now in Salt Lake County. The first one is going to be installed later this year in Utah County. Um, there's a little problem that comes with trains and with increased traffic. Whenever you have, and I'll just kind of get to the side over here, whenever you have a stop and start, 
cars start to back up, that's what we call a queue. Glenn mentioned a queue earlier. Okay, queue is actually a British term for anything that's a line. Okay, leave it to the British, right, to figure out how to spell Q with five letters. But anyway, um, this is a problem. This is a huge problem, especially if that Q gets back here and we've got railroad tracks. Okay, this car is parked here and all of a sudden these tracks uh, or that signal activates. Where does that car go? Where is that car going to go right there at that moment? If it can turn, maybe it will. A lot of times people will just freeze and not know what to do. And here's a train coming at them and they're not sure what they're going to do about it. So huge problem for us. <clears throat> the solution that we've kind of come up with is what we call a cue cutter. Does just exactly what, this, what, the, what the term indicates. We're going to put a signal back here with a, with a sensor on it that says, if we get traffic backing up to here and we think that that traffic may end up on the tracks, we're going to activate that, that signal so that it will stop, stop cars over here on this side and keep the tracks clear. So you've got this situation versus this one. And this is where a lot of times where we're getting increased traffic, more, people, more cars coming, we see these lines backing up, it's a bigger problem for us, especially downtown where you have the frequency of trains coming through, tracks, front runner, different things like that. These cue cutters are gonna come in very handy for us. Um, now, the cue cutter will turn red on two different, uh, at two different times. It will, if there is a train approaching, obviously it's programmed to go to red at that time if there's a train coming. So you may not have this queuing issue over here, but if there's a train coming, the signal will go red. It tells you where to stop on the other side. The other time it will go red is if the queue is starting to back up, then it will go red and tell you to wait on the other side. So you can make sure you have, uh, that there's enough room there. And driving a queue cutter, it's pretty simple. If you're teaching your kids, the driver's ed kids how to say, hey, look, if the light's red, you stop. If it's green, you go. It's kind of easy. Not that hard. Not that hard. Okay, and I think that's, oh, here's, um, <clears throat> I did throw in a picture. This was the, this is kind of a before and after. This was the first cue cutter we installed in Utah, but North Salt Lake up by Big West Oil. All kinds of problems with tr uh, traffic backing there because of the switching of the trains up there. This was the situation before. You can see some of the traffic down there. Um, here, here are the railroad signals, but here's the stop bar, but cars a lot of times would be backed up and stopped on these tracks. That first track is a front runner track. Uh, front runner is about 75 miles an hour through there. Uh, pretty scary. The other tracks are UP tracks are about 45 or 50. Still pretty scary. Um, now we have, and I, I couldn't get the ideal picture, but the cue cutter has been installed here. The stop bar is right here, so it stops traffic on this side, and that intersection stays clear while the trains are coming through. Okay, if that makes sense. I'm not sure. Any questions on, on those types of signals or anything like that, or the ENS sign? Okay, I did my, was I fast enough? Okay. So we just wanted to, yeah, just find out if there's any, any questions or anything you guys that we could help answer with, especially with the interchanges, because Glenn is an expert here. Yeah, so I think we've got about another 10 minutes here and we'd, we'd like to do any, any discussion items if anyone has any questions for us as UDOT employees. Yes. Sure. Help me out, Walt. So shared? I think the, the question is shared track lanes. Jim, I'm thinking we're talking downtown where we have oh, oh. left turn lanes shared with the uh, tracks. Are, we, are they eliminating them? We can't. We, where we're sharing the train with the, with the track. Um, there's just not space down there to do that in a, in a number of those locations. So you'll always have that going. Uh, basically, you've got a train running with the traffic and just becoming another part of the traffic in there. Um, no, no, nothing that I know of right now to eliminate those. Um, luckily downtown with tracks, it's mostly low speed. We have, we've had a fair number of fender benders. I think you guys have heard me talk about probably the biggest challenge we have is the left turns into trains, which is where, um, people will approach an intersection. There's maybe a red arrow or a no left turn sign. But somebody comes up there, they're like, hey, well, nobody's coming, and I want to go over there, and I don't see anybody. So they go real quick. They don't recognize that there could be a train coming up behind them. That's why it's a red arrow. That's why it's red, is we don't want them to do that. Train hits them from behind. That's been our most common accident downtown, is the left turns into trains. How's it going? I wish we could solve the problem, but it's uh, 
Luckily, kind of like Glenn said on some of these others, it's low speed, so we don't have a lot of serious injury crashes there, but there is a lot of body work. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, yes, so the question is on uh, protected lefts versus permissive lefts, which would be the flashing yellow or the green ball, and why we don't use the protected left turn uh, more often during the peak hours. And the, really the answer is capacity. Um, if we have to do serve an entire separate left turn phase, you know, if you consider a traditional signal, if you don't have a left turn phases, it's green in one direction, green in the other direction. Two, two phases. When you add left turns, now you've got to serve a left turn phase, a through phase, left turn phase, and then another through phase. So we're now up to four phases, and we're dividing that pi of the intersection time. You know, if we've got a 120 second intersection cycle, we've got to divide that four ways instead of, instead of two ways. And every time we cycle that between each phase, we lose five or six seconds worth of capacity. So the reason that we often do uh, the permissive left turn really is for capacity. Um, uh, there's an ongoing discussion between myself and our, our signal operations folks. I'm looking at safety and I'm saying, if we go to protected lefts, it really does significantly decrease crashes. And they're looking at me and saying, yeah, but if we do that, nobody will get home. They'll be stuck in traffic. Um, in fact, I, 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 I nerded out on this and I actually said, well, how much is a human life worth? Not, we've, we've got figures for dollars. Human life is somewhere around $10 million. That's the current valuation that we're using to say, what is our, what our safety improvements worth? And we also have a valuation for delay, which is around 25, averages around 25 bucks an hour um, across uh, normal traffic. So I actually took those two numbers and figured out that a human life is worth about 45 years worth of being stuck in traffic. So the question is, do you want to spend the next 45 years of your life <laughs> on I-15 stuck in traffic or be dead? And that, that 45 years is, is roughly where it breaks even based off of the numbers we've got. <laughs> so we're looking at those numbers and saying, what's our, what's our risk reward? Um, because really adding, adding uh, protected left turns is, is very inexpensive and it does improve safety, but when we've looked at what's gonna cost in terms of delay, it costs millions. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing conversation. And really that's actually one of the areas where we as public servants, you know, people who are working for the government, we're, we're, we're looking for input from the public on it. It's, it's important to know what's, what's important to you. Yeah. Yeah. So the so the the comment was that uh, he likes the the yellow arrows. Yes, I'm I'm excited about the yellow, the flashing yellow arrow. It does give us a lot more flexibility for one thing. If we have the doghouse, the old doghouse signals, the uh, the green arrow and the green ball side by side. With those, we always have to serve a permissive phase. Um, if we have the flashing yellow arrow, we have the option to operate entirely protected. And in fact, one in answer uh, to the question from the person behind you as well, we often will do that in areas in times when we have seen hard crashes. Uh, one of the other things that are we're starting to do now as well is when we have a pedestrian crossing that they push the button on the crossing, we will actually lock out the permissive the flashing yellow arrow for that cycle and just go to serve it as a, as a protected movement so that we separate the pedestrian phase and the left turn phase to avoid that conflict, which I'm really excited about. I think that that's a huge safety benefit. So how are we doing on time, Jim? It, it doesn't take much to excite a traffic engineer, does it? It really doesn't take much to excite a traffic engineer. We've got a few more minutes here if you have other yep, questions. Yep, about three or four or five more minutes. I've got actually, maybe if, if I don't see any hands here, I've got a question for, for you which is, uh, what are you telling students to do if they're on the freeway and their car breaks down? What was that? So they, they pull over to the side, 
or say they spin out on on ice and wind up in the on the on the side of the road because stay buckled, stay buckled yes that's something that we're really pushing at, at udot because i used to work in the traffic operations center and on snowy days we'd see people spin off and when they would get out of their car and they're standing behind their car looking at it in the ditch it always drove me nuts because i'm whatever put you there in the ditch is still out there the next and the next car is on its way in and oddly enough in snowstorms that's probably our major cause of fatalities is people getting out of their car standing around and getting hit when the next person slides off otherwise snow days tend to people tend to be driving slower and we tend to see less actual fatalities we see a ton of crashes but the severity goes down in in, in snow yeah, so i'm just gonna gonna add to that you said on the way down you were telling me stay in and then everybody has a cell phone now you can call emergency i mean it used to be you had to get out to take care of something now you don't you can call from there and say hey, this is where i'm at and emergency vehicles can come and, and help you from there then you can be safe so yeah and the question is should you call 911 if you're out of gas and the answer is if you're on the side of the freeway yes you're a, you're a danger to yourself and others when you're stopped on the side of the road and you should stay buckled call 911 if you're in the salt lake valley um, during um, most hours of the weekday and and some days on weekends um, we've got incident management folks at udot who would love to come by and give you a gallon of gas and they'll come up they've got big flashing lights they've got a big truck and and they'll they'll stop so how many imts um i believe we have 24 positions right now they're not all filled as if you've heard labor's in short supply and i really think those guys ought to get paid a lot more for what they do and apparently so did they <laughs> so we, we've got a few openings if you know of anyone who's looking for a really cool job it's actually it's it's one of the more dangerous jobs at udot because you are out in live traffic all day but it actually has one of the best job satisfactions because it's You're the one person people. from udot that almost everybody's glad to see when that person pulls up, changes a flat tire for someone, uh, gives them a gallon of gas. I, I used to be over that program, and, and we got a lot of really, really great letters from people saying, hey, you made my day. It was, <laughs> it, was, it was a great program to be associated with. It. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Um, you know, I don't have that number off. So the question, let me repeat it so we get it on the audio here. Uh, the question is on divided highway crossings, you're probably thinking of like Mountain View Corridor. Uh, we're seeing well, the double um, red indications on the top uh, to, to reinforce that red light. We actually have had a problem with red light running out there. I don't know the answer off the top of my head. I haven't seen the data on that. Um, I do know that we are continuing to put them in, so I'm assuming that the numbers are positive, but I would have to check up on that. Other questions? Because so I think we're about 10 minutes till, which I think was... Uh, that our time? That's our time. So thank you very much, everyone.